Yeah, okay, good. Okay, nice to see everybody. Nice to see Chris smiling even after that result last night. Uh, so, so have we got any apologies, substitutions, or declarations of interest? Convener, we have apologies submitted by Councillor Jackson with Councillor Brennan substituting. Uh, note the declaration from Chris Curley in the chat. Are there any other declarations of interest? Yes, we do. On you go, Graham. Convener Dallas will say to River Clyde Holmes, item six. Okay, thank you. Yes, I also have a declaration to make as well. Uh, it's in respect of the Peyton Street Hall, where I was part of the group uh, that tried to secure the the uh, hall. Um, I am quite happy to proceed on a vote with that, as I don't think I have any uh, conflicting interests. Okay. Um else? No. Can, okay. Can we okay, thank you. Now, before we move on can, to item number can, two, yeah, can, sorry. Okay, Chris. Convener. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's, it's not a declaration of interest. Yeah, I'm Chris. happy to just take your direction on it. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with the recommendation that item five should be taken in private, and I believe it should be taken in public session because it's a £13 million contract. So, would you like me to move that resolution now, or would you like me to wait until item five to move the resolution for item five? I to think we'll move it to item five, Chris. I think we'll move it to item five comes up, Chris. That's okay. All right. Okay with that. Okay. Okay. Before we move on to item number two, I'd like to bring in Stuart, um, and I think he's going to explain to members of the committee why the agenda papers were late this week. Uh, Stuart. Do you can be now. Um, the original purpose of this meeting, this special meeting, was to make members aware of the waste contract before the summer recess. The tender process was always going to be tight, and accordingly, the papers issue was always going to be a to follow. I had hoped that the papers would have been issued at the tail end of last week. However, that wasn't possible. Uh, we didn't issue the economic regeneration strategy, as I only wanted to have one issue of to follow papers. And I do therefore apologise to the committee for the late issue of the to follow papers. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, am, I, am I the only person kind of struggling to hear Stuart there? Is everybody else the same? Was it my connection? Everybody else okay there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. 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 We'll move on to item number two, which is the economic strategy report. Stuart, you want to speak to the report? Thanks, Convener. Uh, the economic regeneration strategy sets out our aspiration and action for the economic act development activity in Inverclyde, with our ambition clear to create, attract, and safeguard more and better jobs in Inverclyde. This will lead the way to a more inclusive, prosperous, competitive, balanced, and sustainable local economy delivering economic regeneration for the benefit of all of our businesses, residents and communities, whilst maximising funding support. The economic situation was, including, was improving in Inverclyde, but no one could have foreseen either the COVID-19 pandemic nor its impact on our economy, with potentially a triple-dip recession. Our focus is on people, place, business and partnership with five priority themes. We see threat, but we also see opportunity and our priorities are to boost skill levels and reduce worklessness, to accelerate the regeneration of strategic employment sites and town centres, to progress the renewal and economic regeneration of the most deprived areas of Inverclyde, to increase Inverclyde's capacity to accommodate jobs, particularly in the private sector, and to grow and diversify our business base. Convener, when I look at the action plan, which is for a two-year period, it sets out a significant suite of interventions. I do recognise that I have an outstanding remit to develop a community wealth building strategy. You will see that I do make reference to it in the strategy. There is further work to be done in this subject, both at a national, regional and local level. And I'll bring an re update report to the, the committee in August. Happy to take any questions. Okay, Stuart, thanks very much. I don't see any kind of questions in the chat. Does anybody have a question? Graham? Thanks very much, Convener. 
Um, goodness me, my computer's just going silly. Um, yeah, I thought me in um, 2.2, page 5, talks about the wider strategic context. And on a number of occasions, obviously, well, it, it, it engages with everybody who's part of the context, which obviously is fantastic. And I don't want public session here, but I'm just wanting to get a a flavour of senior officer's opinion is, do we really think that the Inverclyde Alliance partnership, et cetera, are as effective as it could be, or we could be, because obviously we are a key part of that alliance. And throughout the strat strategic and development and the action plan, um, obviously different organisations are mentioned, but it, of course we're the council, of course we're seen as the one to drive the wheel, but there's so much more in Inverclyde than simply its local authority. So my question to Stuart uh, is, do we have confidence or is there anything else we can do to bring other people to this table to put more energy, more effort, even more resources to drive this policy forward? Thanks, Graham. Stuart? Through you, Convener. Um, this is Inverclyde Council's economic regeneration strategy, and you'll recognise that we have a clear link with Riverside Inverclyde because we are delivering uh, many of the management functions through Riverside Inverclyde under an SLA. Um, the, I think that Councillor Brooks' question is slightly unfair from the point of view that this report focuses on Inverclyde Council's regeneration strategy. Clearly, there are elements within the partnership recovery plan, which Councillor Brooks will be aware of, whereby the driver is the council, but other partners are also contributing to that. So um, the, the response that we have in Inverclyde is a pan-Inverclyde response that requires all partners to uh, participate in that response. And for example, within the economic section of the partnership recovery plan, you will see that there are a number of partners who are contributing to that recovery plan. But Councillor Brooks, this is the council's economic strategy. Um, all of part of the um, agenda under community wealth building is that partners and other anchor organisations will participate in the community wealth building agenda. And that's something which I'll happily cover in the community wealth building update that I bring to uh, committee in August. Thanks very much, Stuart. Thanks for a clear response. I, I just the frustration I would suggest of members that you know, of course, this is our policy and our um, our document. But you know, the more we can get behind regenerating Inverclyde, the better. And it's a frustration to do better for Inverclyde. Uh, fully supportive of the paper you put in front of us today. Thanks, yeah, um, Councillor Brooks, through you, Convener, the Inverclyde recovery is obviously going to have to be a full partnership recovery plan, and that's why it's important that we recognise within the document that there are other partners out there. We can't do this ourselves, uh, but as I say, uh, trying to, to address your concerns about the Inverclyde Alliance is not uh, the purpose of this report. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Okay, Chris, Chris Connolly. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I think I've, uh, I, I, I take what you call uh, Stuart, Stuart's uh, uh, comments about the, the late uh, receipt of the report by, by members. I think it's, it's good that we see this information as, as early as possible. So, uh, especially given the, the, the amount of, of information that's in this. That being said, I'm I'm generally content with the contents of the report and of of the of the strategy going forward. Uh, one thing I would, would like to mention is it centres around the strategic employment sites on page sixteen of the report, uh, section four point four point one, and it mentions in screen, and then it also goes on to talk about James Watt Dock, etc. Now, obviously, the the in screen means a lot of things of different people. Uh, we've got the general end screen area, which encompasses what they call the end screen city deal site plus end screen dry dock. I think these are strategic employment sites, so I'd, I'd like to I'd like to have seen a little bit more description about what exactly we mean by end screen. Uh, similarly, when we talk about James Watt Dock, it talks about uh, opportunities for business premises and sugar sheds or housing developments. Obviously, looking at the local development plan, 
and how it interfaces with that. We're also looking at marine and maritime engineering and maritime uh, uses as well. So I'd like to have seen them highlighted within the, the text of this report. Uh, and similarly, we go to page 31. Again, we talked about James Watt Dock. Again, it would be very useful again when we're talking about what we can actually do in there. There's no mention about the opportunities for uh, maritime engineering and how that could possibly link to the wider regeneration of in screen and then screen dry docks. So I think it's an opportunity to maybe uh, 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 add a little bit more. I don't know how we'd go about that given we're asked to, 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 to what do you call it, approve this report today. But I'd like to have seen a wee bit more information about in screen and James Watt Dock and the and the, 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 the industrial uh, opportunities in, in those sites as well. Yep. Convener, through you, um, the the report which you have in front of you is very much the uh, the detail. Um, it will be worked up into a glossy, and as part of the transition between the report which you have uh, before you with the information that's there, um, we I'm sure that within the formation of the glossy document, we can provide some clarity in respect of the in-screen site and the the uh, James Watt Dock site. For clarity, Councillor Curley, it's from the as for information, the in-screen site that's referred to goes from Douglas Way, Douglas Ray Road all the way to the end of the dry dock from the A8 to the Great Harbour. So it's the full site. And I'm happy to provide some clarity on that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I mean, that would be very useful, Stuart, because I think is uh, that's one thing we've picked up over time is that there's a lot of uh, different what you call meanings to when we talk about in-screen. So it'd be good to get have that sort of clarity within the report. I'm, I'm very pleased we're talking about the whole area of in-screen there within the, the, the economic site. So that'd be good to have that within the report if that's possible before we, we, we get it all laminated. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. John, John Crowder. Thank you, Convener. Um, if, you, if you go to page 41, and it's the updating and reviewing of the strategy, and one part that I do welcome very much is that it states that, that in a, a, each year that there will be a review of the strategy. That's to be, to be welcomed. That leads into the second part, and it basically has been touched upon. Uh, where there was mention of the local de development plan. Now, we are aware that the local development plan uh, is out for a uh, consultation. And I would assume that uh, once all the um, responses ha have been uh, collated, that um, any changes may well be incorporated into the current strategy. Sure, yeah, through you, Convener. Um, any changes that are likely to be incorporated in the local development plan outputs, Councillor Crowther, would be after year one. Um, you'll recognise that the local development plan consultation process uh, for the proposed plan concludes in July. Uh, thereafter, there's uh, officers have to review that and come up with some, some scheduled force if there are matters which can't be resolved. And therefore, there will be an examination. So it would only be after the examination that any changes in the local development plan would be reflected in the economic regeneration strategy. Okay, Stuart, that's very nice. Lovely, thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'm obviously pleased to see this report here before us today. Um, obviously, I'd like to see it uh, before now, but. I recognise, obviously, we've been going through a pandemic for the last 15 months, so that's obviously affected the ability to sort of deliver the strategy earlier than, than otherwise would have been the case. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that Stuart is going to bring an update report on community wealth building uh, to the August meeting, because I think it is important that we understand uh, what we mean by community wealth building, what opportunities it provides as part of the re regeneration strategy. Um, Graham, Graham's obviously raised the the issue of the sort of the the, the wider partnership approach to um, economic regeneration, and I think he, he will obviously be aware that the Alliance Board recently agreed that we would have a new strategic priority for the local 
income improvement plan being the economy and the, the most recent meeting um was some sort of meat started to be put on the bones of that and we agreed that the the population partnership group would oversee that strategic priority but i think it's right it's important that through through the mechanism the alliance we're trying to ensure that um we we have a joined up approach to uh the economic strategy locally with all all the key partners so i'm sure we'll get further further work on that over the the the, the coming months john john's obviously highlighted the issue about the annual review and report and i think that's that's important and i i probably would like to see that maybe captured in the the recommendations that we sort of uh Note that there'll be an annual review and a, an annual re report because it's very much important that this is a sort of live document and it's not something that's simply put on a, sh a shelf and dusted down every four, four or five years. It has to be a, a, a live, evolving document. I think the Stuart recognises that in the in the text that it is a sort of rolling rolling strategy. So I think it is important that we, we get that annual review and annual update and an and, and annual report. And it would probably be useful if we did capture that in the recommendations that we, we know there'll be an annual review and an, an annual update report to committee. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Chris, Chris McElhinney. Yeah, thanks, con convener. Appreciate the comments so far. Just, just for the record, I, I got this report on Monday, so I mean, I, I didn't realise there was an issue, so I thought two days was more than ample enough time to read the report, and I certainly had enough time to read the contents with my group and the council. Um, one, one of the points I wanted to highlight was on page 20 of the council's regeneration team. So, so for comparison, Eastern Bartonshire, I think, got about £30 million pound through the, the city region deal, and the, the, the city deals don't seem to have invested any money based on deprivation. So. There's, there's not really a level up agenda here. Everyone's just getting an equal share of the pie. So I'm not quite sure how the Scottish government intends to start tackling deprivation if they just keep sharing pots of money across Scotland without putting any, you know, strategic viewpoint into well, how do you actually target the, the need of the money into, you know, communities such as Inverclyde? Um, you know, because our we 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 could probably write a bid for about a hundred million pound of projects that would be already of the Scottish government. Uh, released the capital for us. So that was the point I wanted to ask on in, in the the area securing external funding and investment. So obviously it's talking about the council, but if you think back to 2014 when, you know, obviously Alex Salmon brought Jim McCall into Ferguson's, there was twenty nine million pounds of investment from out with Inverclyde came into Ferguson's shipyard over that period. And, you know, think think back to twenty nineteen, the, the council leader and myself, you know, we were able to work cross party. We could go into the yard we, we could have discussions with the management of the yard. They could present plans to you. Whereas over the last two years, you know, that's under the responsibility of the Scottish government. But until then, there seemed to be quite a good partnership relationship between um, yourself, Mr. Jimison, Mr. Allen before you, uh, the, the private entity that ran the, the yard, and indeed to a lesser extent, the Scottish government. But in the last two years, there doesn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever, certainly no progress updates in terms of investment in Inverclyde. So, although the, in terms of leading on bids and proposals to ex secure external funding, probably is focused more on funding the council has direct control of, a lot of the funding we need to secure in, into Inverclyde actually will come from the government. Whereas at the moment, it, it, unless there's conversations happening that we don't get reported at the committee, it doesn't seem to me that there is any, you know, great level of, you know, you know, want or will to come to the table in Inverclyde to actually put funding up front explain is what the long term strategic plan is. You know, I think the, the Clyde mission statement was was published when Derek Mackay was still the finance secretary. Um and, and you know we don't really seem to have any meat on the bone in terms of what that mission is going to look like for Inverclyde in terms of direct investment to tackle the issues that we know we've got in terms of regeneration. So I was wondering if Mr Jimison could maybe just give us an update in terms of what correspondence and liaison he's had with the Scottish Government in terms of putting investment in Inverclyde to actually support the, the regeneration strategy that we, we've got in place. Because I think it's pretty clear that we've got the plan, but that plan needs funding from the Scottish Government. And, you know, I certainly be, would be keen to see if there's any intentions. For example, the one example I used, Ferguson's. Um, are we asking Ferguson's to meet with the, the, the council officials, whether it's the council leadership or the council's executive officers, to set out what their plans are? Because, you know, if that's going to be the industrial 
revival of you know not just Inverclyde but the west of Scotland we should be involved in those plans but you know at the moment I just you know seem to have a situation everyone that sends a letter gets a letter ignored we don't we don't quite know what the strategy is you know we're, we're over two years on from when the Scottish government told us they would make a decision on whether they would directly award ferries to the yard and we're still waiting on a decision on that and of course that's important because that then allows us as a council to look towards what other inward investment we want to attract into the River Clyde to help, you know, grow into Inch Green Dry Dock, grow then onwards into James Watt uh, Marina and then grow onwards into our town centre in terms of all the opportunities that just all join up. But, you know, there seems to be that loggerhead up at Port Glasgow, which, you know, if we're talking about regeneration, you just think of the transformation over the last five years, sorry, the five years from 2014 to 2019, how the yard changed. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a symbolic welcome to Inver Clyde. The amount of investment into that yard, where it just seems that something's went wrong there, and and I don't know if the council's got a locus and to try to find out what's went wrong. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> Short. Through you, convener, um, councillor McElhenney makes reference to city deal, and of course, uh, not all city deal funding, but we have through the the auspices of city deal, uh, three projects which come to a total of thirty two million pounds within Inverclyde. More recently, we have attracted one point three six million pounds from the Clyde Mission Fund, which is Scottish government funding uh, into the Blater Shed at Inch Green. Um, so we are engaged on a regular basis with Scottish government officials in respect of trying to create and maximise opportunities for external funding within Inverclyde. Uh, members will also be aware of the, the Leveling Up Fund, and we're looking at two bids for the Leveling Up Fund. And indeed, the Community Renewal Fund, albeit both of those are UK government uh, initiatives, we're constantly on the look for money for Inverclyde. Uh, with regards to Ferguson's, uh, we want to improve our relationship with Ferguson's. We believe that there are opportunities for further employment within Ferguson's, and that's on my list of actions to do uh, to, to improve the Council's relationship currently with Ferguson's. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the wider point, obviously, you know, if you look at Eastern Bartonshire, they got more in city deal funding than Inverclyde, but quite clearly we've got a greater level of deprivation. So I just think going forward, we need to make representations to the Scottish Government that they have to get a lot better at targeting resources to the areas that actually need it to make a difference, as opposed to just try to, you know, please everyone by spreading the cash, which then doesn't level anything up, it just keeps everything the, the same as it is, particularly, you know, if you want to then start creating city deals in the east of the country, which then just, you know, keeps the, the population going from the west to the east. Okay, thanks, Chris. Stephen, you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with Chris's general point around sort of um, inclusive growth, that we should be targeting the resources that the areas in greatest need. And you're right, if if everybody gets a city deal, then it sort of undermines the 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 the, the purpose of trying to uh, invest in the areas in, in greatest need. East on Barnsha, Stuart will keep me right, didn't he actually get thirty million pounds from the, the, the city deal? They they never bid for a project originally. They they are progressing a project at the moment, which is a transport project. I'm not sure what the sort of value of that is in terms of that, but we we certainly obviously ha, ha, had our three projects. But we've also got a, a, a waiting on a report from the Fraser of Allender Institute that we've commissioned with a couple of neighbouring councils to try and make the case for additional resources for areas like Inverclyde, which particularly are. Suffering from from uh, obviously depopulation, and I don't know, um, Stuart, if you're able to update us and and where we are with that particular report that we've commissioned. Sure. Through you, Convener, uh, Council McCabe is correct that um, Eastern Berkshire was the only one out of the eight metropolitan city region councils which was not successful in getting a, a, an original uh, city deal project. Uh, you're both right from the point of view that there is currently an application that's progressing through a uh, strategic business case to outline business case for a £30 million roads project, but it's got some way to go, Councillor McElhenney, before it's approved. Um, but the, 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 the point is not lost on me that the Eastern Berkshire have uh, got a potentially live city deal project. With regards to the Fraser of Allender, 
question convener, I'm afraid I, I can't give you an update, but I'll happily get an update for the committee and provide that to members. Okay, thanks, Joe. Okay, anybody else? No. Peter, could you maybe just go through the recommendations and if the committee agree, uh, add the an annual review as uh, Stephen was, was asking for to what we're agreeing here? Just checking I'm not on mute for once in my life. Okay, so um, the recommendations are uh, that the, there's asked to approve the attached to the Embercloud Regeneration Strategy, including an action plan to authorise the Interim Service Director uh, Environment and Economic Recovery to seek endorsement of the RI, RIPH Board, and then to bring forward an, an annual review uh, in, in a year's time uh, of, the, uh, of, of this plan. Yeah. I mean, I think it's. I think it is a matter of maybe just noting that there will be an annual review and, and an annual report on on the plan to the committee, so that we've we've got that as a recorded minute, and it's a it's an outstanding action that will require to come back to committee. It's just we we typically do that to just to try and ensure we've got that on our agenda. Stuart, Stuart I'm sure will will deliver it, but um, um, it's just to, I think it would be useful just so that we're aware of that. So, for the purposes of the minute, then we'll we'll note an item C for the recommendations that there'll be an, an annual review in twelve months' time of the Emberclyde regeneration strategy. Yeah. Okay. Can we agree that? I think Stuart there. wants to come in, convener. Oh, just sure. convener, if, with your indulgence, um, it would be in twelve months' time. What we'll be doing is we'll be doing it every Christmas. So it's at the t end of the calendar year. So it's as per the the uh, strategy. There's a time scale whereby we're looking to make sure that. Uh, boards and committees are made aware of what's been going on. So yes, there will be an annual review. But if Mr. Uh, uh, McDonald simply doesn't put the within twelve, if he puts within twelve months, as opposed to in twelve months' time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we agree the recommendations? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Item number three is a property assets management report. Eddie, are you taking this? I am. Thanks, convener. Okay. Um, the report covers four items, uh, with the first two items summarising the outcome of public consultations on potential use of open space at Cattle Hill Street and Paper Mill Road in Greenock. Uh, on the Cattle Hill Street, although there were many responses in support of the proposals, there were also concerns expressed mainly from local residents and predominantly in connection with traffic and lack of parking. As noted in the report, Permalot have since withdrawn their interest in this site, electing to focus their efforts on the Paper Mill Road site. Um, on the paper mill roads, um, the responses received were reasonably evenly split. Um, the, the private paper later on the agenda deals with the terms of any lease, subject to the, the committee's decision on whether or not to support the proposals. Um, the present street site item um, simply requests permission to expand the previous approval obtained to market the site for sale to include the consideration of leasing, following inquiries received in respect of the site. Um, the Mern Street item seeks approval to demolish the existing low quality buildings on the site. Um, which the committee has previously given approval to market for sale, as in the site. This will assist in marketing and address ongoing costs in respect of rates and security inspections, and is also removing the risk of um, vandal damage and arson. Um, so that's effectively um, a summary of the report. I'd ask the committee note the outcome of the public consultations, approve the recommendations in respect of the Crescent Street and Mern Street sites in 3.4 and 3.5. And, and provide a, a direction in respect to the proposed use of the paper mill road site by the Permalock Group um, in 3.3. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks for that, Eddie. Chris, Chris Connolly. Thank you, Convener. With respect to item 3.3, based on the representations made and the concerns regarding the parking in the facility, we would propose to the the, we should uh, instruct the interim head of legal service to withdraw from negotiations for the proposed lease, i.e., recommendation to follow recommendation 3.3a. Okay. Graham, do you want to come at this point? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, yeah, I, I'm just looking to see that recommendation. So, yeah, I feel understand item 3.3b was what I've agreed. C can I just get some direction? So, there's been a public consultation on the use of Carter Hill Street area, um, 4.1, and obviously the potential person has withdrawn. What does that do for that area? 
Um, do we have further consultations of use of the public space? Um, is it open? You know, just can somebody help me? What happens there? I think everybody's happy that um, with the with the with the recommendation, but it's the future of that. Um, maybe not for today's decision. Or clearly not for today's decision. But can somebody help me with the future tense? Um, so, so you can be now. Um, there is no plans for the site, although we have had contact from residents um, who are interested in, in forming a properly constituted group and potentially um, making an application to to kind of um, turn it into a kind of public green space. So that that, that is a kind of current live inquiry, um, but it obviously depends on the residents actually forming a group that, that is able to make a bid. Okay, thanks very much. I, I'm aware of that group, um, and I believe they have been appropriately constituted um, as of recently. There's a few documents in the private context of these papers that would certainly help them. I, I'm just thinking about item six um, from a, a local youth organisation. Um, but as they're private papers, um, obviously, I, I've not, clearly I've not shared them. But I just wonder um, what help we would be able to give this newly constituted organisation to put a bid together. It'd be great if they could see that bid from that youth organisation, but that's not for me to divulge that. Um, so you can be there. Obviously, they, can, they are engaging with officers at the moment, and they can continue to engage with officers, and, and we will provide that support as best we can to, to help them through the process. Um, that's, as, that's all I can say at the moment. As I say, I'm not dealing directly with that. Um, the officer who is is not on the call today, um, but we can come back uh, when we have more detail. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kavina. Okay, thank you. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Kavina. I'm just a wee bit confused, right? So we're saying that permalot, but we all agree, is, is a good idea in the growth of allotments in, in the community gardens and the, the whole idea of asset transfer. We're, we're in favour of that as a council. I'm just unsure of Chris. Is is the SNP actually? Are they saying they're against it? They they don't. They're against permalot getting the site at Paper Mill Road. Is that my understanding from that? That you're actually against that whole idea of asset transfer and and giving that to permalot to build allotments in community garden. On on that particular site, yeah. yes, and not not in principle, but on that particular site, yes. Right. I'm I'm really surprised. That's that's all. Sorry, convener. Um, I'm I I think it would be a, a a fantastic use of that site. To to tell you the truth, um, I I, I think it's something that we've been crying out for. And given that Permalot is putting a lot of their attention from Cadder Hill Street, that I've been in favour of as well. But given that they're actually now concentrating, it, and I, I know yourselves, a ward member, convener. I, I know you. There is concerns about past and all that from that area, but in all honesty, it's one of our first, if not only, we've had a group like this who are, have been interested in doing that community transfer. Um, and I've got to admit, I'm all in favour of that. I think it would be a fantastic idea. Okay, thanks, Jim. Stephen? Yeah, I mean, Jim largely beat me too. I was, I was seeking a bit of clarity because Clearly, there's been a lot of representations around Cadda Hill Street and the group of withdrawn. And when I, I read the representations around Paper Mill Road, I wasn't so sure as to that there was a strong feeling against it. And I think Chris mentioned uh, parking as be, 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 being an issue in terms of their, their concerns. So it would be useful to to, to understand. What the SNP group's specific concerns are around this particular site. Um, to me, it seems to be a, a reasonably good site, and I agree. I agree with Jim. I mean, it's one of the things that we should be trying to encourage. Yeah. First, do you want to come back in on that before I bring in Chris McElhenney? I no problem. I think it, I think we uh, as a group and uh, personally, I'm in favour of what we call of more allotments, etc. Things like that. I think there is there is an issue about where we get get the right site. There there is uh, I think there's a there is an issue with the parking on on that on that street with regard to the, there's lots of traffic generators. You've got access to the cot. You've got access to the local house in there as well. Plus you've got the you got the 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 school. Uh, so we don't think that probably the what they call it, that having that on top of all those other what they, all those generators there would would be the best 
the 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 best what they call it, position for having a site. Uh, we we have what they call it, hundreds of thousands of acres in Inverclyde. Surely we can we can find a, another one that might be a, a bit better without also having the other impacts, which was on the past, etc. Which I know that we could probably address through the lease, but I think the, the our concern is that is is on that and looking at the, the, the consultations as a whole, there is probably not much difference between the two Cabell Hill site and that. When I looked through, I could see that, but I think just generally with respect to what they call it, with the possibility of, of generating traffic and, and the ongoing issues there is at that point, we, we don't think that that's the, the, the best site for it. Gail, Gail, can I bring you in here? Have you, have, has, have the roads team looked at a potential solution to the, the kind of car parking issue? Uh, for access and the, the allotments if they were put on the site? Um, not currently in detail, but what we would be looking at is just making sure that there's like safe access and that there's passing places and that if people are parking, that um, they're in a lit environment. So the team would work closely to ensure that that could be carried out and if there was any restrictions required to support it. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Chris, Chris McLean, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Container. I, I've also got concerns about the, the Paper Mill Road site. Um, I suppose the first point is I think it's actually quite a misleading name because it's not on Paper Mill Road. It's, it's actually nowhere near Paper Mill Road. Yeah. So when I first read this report, I was thinking off the top of my head it was the, the former Scottish Waterworks site or perhaps uh, in page 36, some of Mr Dunlop actually references, you know, the former community farm, which is on Paper Mill Road. I thought that was the site, but it's obviously not. And he actually does make a good point. I noticed that Mr McDonald says, you know, they don't have any records of their community farm being there, but there was a community farm there. Um, I think it shut down about 1993, for memory, um, which I can remember. Um, so I, I think there are other sites quite close by that could be better. So if you, if you actually go further north towards the cut, and then push yourself, um, sorry, further south towards the cut and push yourself east. There's a lot of land that Scottish Water have land banked, um, you know, that has no meaningful purpose whatsoever, other than the fact that there's a few pump houses, you know. So there's a lot of land between the, the compensation reservoir, which is the, the reservoir people call the Long Dam that runs from the Waterman's Cottage all the way over to Old Large Road, um, which then takes you to Windhill Golf Course. There's a lot of land there that Scottish Water have. Um, which is flat and could be suitable. But the, the point on parking, I think, if you, if you actually you need to understand or perhaps visit the site, is that this is a substantial typographical nightmare. That's why housing's never been built on it. It uh, must be on a gradient of about 15 degrees. Um, so to, to one side, you've got Windhill Primary School, and then below it, you've got what used to be known as Kenilworth, which is still in the local plan for you know, 400, 500 houses. So at the moment, a lot of cars park there, for drop off and collection at Windhill Primary School, the roads department have just on Paper Mill Road itself done a substantial stretch of double lines because of the clear road safety issues there. Because you know that there isn't adequate parking for the nature, of the, as we all know, people want to park right at schools, etc. So what does work quite sensibly is a lot of parents park on you know what would have been Woodstock Road or Kenilworth Crescent, whatever it was. And you would really be talking about taking that away because if you were wanting to make, as Gail saying, safe passing spaces, safe access to an allotment, you know, you would have cars parked there for the allotment, which would mean that the parents that are parking there for the school couldn't park there. They would then just offset themselves back round onto the other side of Peter Mill Road, up where the janitor's house is as you're going up to the green cut if you're driving up towards Overton. So I think there would be quite a substantial amount of displacement in parking, which would be an issue. Those aren't issues that shouldn't, you know, Block the project. The, the main concern for me is I don't think there's been a biodiversity report into this. This is, you know, a substantial area uh, in size, which is, you know, in, 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 in indigenous fauna and flora. Uh, there are colonies of deer that, that live in this area. You'd be talking about basically having to cut down all those trees, uh, cut all that long grass down to make an allotment, and there's a clear environmental impact there because you lose all of that. You replace it with an allotment, which you know I'm all for allotments, but I, I personally don't. I mean, obviously the the provider must know their stuff. I personally don't see how they're going to, you know, thrive in allotments on a on a, a piece of land that's you know 15 degrees gradient. Um, but what you will lose is you lose all that long grass, you lose all that fauna, um, and you know I think that would be a real loss to you know that that part of Inverclyde. It's, it's a really nice green place, 
complement the Greenock Cemetery across the other side of the valley, which is another dear green place. Um, it's it, and it's a, and it is an area that I, ju I don't think we should just you know run roughshed over just going in with the mulchers, mulching all the trees away, mulching all the long grass and in, in, in indigenous habitat to replace it with an allotment. When and when it has been mentioned, you know there there are ample sites across Inverclyde for big, you know large community allotments. Uh, I don't think this is the right site um, for various reasons. So I, I wouldn't support this, and I would support Chris Curley's uh, uh, sorry amendment to the, the recommendation on it. Thanks, Chris. Anything, Joe, I comment at this point? Um, I mean, there's not a lot I can add to this. As I say, there are no details of the proposals at this stage. This is a kind of um, agreement in principle. It's, it's sought um, that we need to develop the proposals um, from here. Um, the only thing I can add in terms of my knowledge of the site is when we extended the school, there was certainly significant earth moving um, activity and there was a lot of Earth um, placed in that side of the site at that time, and um, we I don't recall any significant um, issues or issues in terms of um, habitat species that, that stopped that project at that time. Um, but that's not to say that's changed over the intervening years. So I'm afraid I don't have any other information to add um, at this point. Okay, uh, thanks, John Crowther. John, you want to come in? Yes, yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, I can't add. Anything um, further than that added to uh, by Councillor McElhaney and Councillor Curley, other than to add that uh, in the local development plan in 2017, uh, we had the main issues report, and on that main issues report, we had four sites that were identified uh, for uh, existing uh, allotments. There was also seven potential uh, other sites as well, and kind of like nine other sites. The four sites, three of them are currently used. That's at Caddle Hill Street, Wellington Street, and Belleville Street. But there's also one at Murdison Street. And, and I know that um, applications had been made and subsequently dropped for the use of that site. So there is currently one existing site that is unused. And there is potential nine other sites. Could they be revisited? And Permalot actually pointed in, in that uh, other direction. Okay, John, thanks for that. Uh, Ennis. Thank you, Karina. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, looking at it from a farming perspective, um, you, you wouldn't put a solar energy site on a, a north-facing site, and it's not the best site to be growing stuff in allotments or, or from a farming perspective either, because it's north-facing. So, um, you know, I, I would have thought it would have been better south facing slope somewhere in Inverclyde that could be utilised for allotments. Um, but my question was, um, and Stuart Jamison probably could answer this would this have to go to planning? Stuart? Sure. you can a yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Stephen? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously strong feelings on this particular site. I think there's clearly sort of support in principle for having sites for allotments, but there's clearly strong feelings on this site, and a number of concerns have been been raised. I don't know whether there's there's clearly not a willingness to enter into a sort of lease at this stage, but whether there's a willingness to raise and explore the concerns that members have um with the the organization to see if any of these can be if they can be addressed at this particular site um and come back with a further report uh and or uh engage with them over potential other sites i suppose the difficulty in terms of other sites is that um, this site's in our ownership so we we can we can control the the lease of the site. There might be other sites, but they may not be in our, our ownership. I mean, Chris obviously talks about Scottish Scottish waterland. Um, they're, they're not known for um, necessarily um, giving up their land too too easily, or certainly not with without getting some recompense in, in in return. So, I suppose it's whether we want to rule this site out completely, or consider whether the the concerns can be addressed and or look at. Um, alternative sites. 
Okay. Are we? Is, is anybody else want to come in? First of all, no. We would be happy to to take on board Stephen's thoughts by contacting the company and and maybe explore the issues that we've discussed and the potential for looking at other sites. Are we pretty happy to go with that on this? Yeah. Yes. Is there any other comments on any other items within the the paper? No. No, no comments. I, I, think, no. I think I think uh, I'll be I think content of that. I think uh, to to look it back and look to see if there are other sites. I think we we do need to look seriously at the issues that we obviously we raised today about parking. Uh, uh, what uh, Chris McElhenney, Chris, Chris McElhenney has raised about what they call biodiversity. Uh, I'm reminded of the fact is that we, we did actually agree as a, as, as a, a, an organisation that any any of the things that come to what they call it to to uh, papers that come to committee would have the environmental effects considered. And also, I suppose that is a good example that, that Chris has raised there about the biodiversity effects that it might have in a, uh, the flora and fauna in the surrounding area. So I'm happy enough to what they call it to. To would you call it to take that back to see what we can do here? But uh, we, as as a group, I suppose we're, we're still to be convinced that this would be a, a, a suitable site. Right. Okay. Okay. So Peter, do you want? To, I'm keeping you busy, Peter. You want to get through the recommendations? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so that's what I'm here for. Um, so if we're content with um, recommendations, therefore three point one and three point two, but as regards three point three, we simply continue the matter uh, for a further report to be brought to the committee. Um, to address some following discussion between um, officers and the group to try and address some of the members' concerns uh, and also to explore alternative locations. Can okay, can we agree that? Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Okay, item number four is the Roads and Transportation Performance Update Report. Gail. Thank you, Convener. This report sets out an update on the performance of the road service to align with the release of the local benchmarking data for 1920. The report demonstrates that the 44 million capital funding invested has raised the condition of the network from our position in 2012 of 31 out of 32 local authorities to 19th now. The benchmarking data is contained within um, 4.2, showing the five performance indicators and the council's placing in each. And in addition, Inverclyde Council has been identified as a finalist in two APSE best performer categories. This was street lighting and roads, highways and winter maintenance. And the assessment criteria is included in 4.3. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Gil. Uh, John. John Trouther. Yeah, all I was actually doing there was just um, identifying where the locations of the... Uh, oh, sorry, John, sorry, That was all. Sorry. But there is a I question uh, from Stephen McCabe. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry, John. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a, a very positive report, and it's uh, good to see the significant progress that's been made over the, the last uh, 10 years uh, uh, or so. Um, and to see the services um, performance being recognised by external uh, bodies as well. But just in terms of the, the roads asset management plan, obviously the existing plan is a 10-year plan, and we're, we're coming to the end of that 10-year plan. Is it the intention to sort of take stock and then develop another uh, roads assets management plan and, and bring that forward to committee? And obviously we need to... To look at how we we can fund that as as well. Um, thank yeah. you, Councillor. Thank you, Convener. Yes, that would be the intention of the service that we will now be looking to review um, the previous um, roads asset management plan and take forward into a new um, plan that will come to committee for officers um, to present to members for consideration. Okay. Chris, I'm sorry I missed you there. Graeme, I'll bring you in first and then bring in Chris uh, McElhenney. Graeme. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I concur with what Stephen has just said. It's good to get a positive report on uh, the performance. There's lots of money, lots of taxpayers' money has been invested. And we've got an independent report that says it good we are. 
But could I suggest if we go to the local press, local social media, or even knocking our neighbours, this would not be the context of their conversation when we speak about the quality of our roads and our, our assets, etc. I just wonder what, I don't know if Gail or any other officer has an opinion of what um, has gone wrong in the perception of our constituents in comparison to the performance by the uh, performance indicators from this independent provider. Um, thank you, Councillor, um, through you, Convener. Um, the Council have a defect classification um, policy, so we go out and we inspect defects and we repair those defects aligned to the kind of defect that it is. Um, with the period that we had during the pandemic, we weren't able to be addressing um, non-emergency defects and also an element of our projects were not delivered last year. So we are working to catch up on this, but we also feel that it's important for members of the public to see the type of work that we are carrying out. So we'll be looking at how do we share that information so that the members of the public understand um, what work is being undertaken, but also understand how we do classify defects and how we do repair defects and how we do determine um, our programme of works. Thanks very much, Kivia. Um, yeah, that, that's that, that's great to, to hear, Gail. Um, my my challenge to myself, to the council, I suppose, is to get the comms right and to ensure that we have a, a robust understanding. Um, so we have a response sorry, that our constituents have an understanding of of how we go about those repairs, the classifications. They are quite technical, and obviously I ain't no roads engineer. Uh, reading the papers, I can understand them. So they're not highly technical issues. But I just wonder the best way that we can communicate to ensure um, we can celebrate the good things that we do in Inverclay, because all too often um, we're, we're brought down, but often that's by our constituents. So I, I welcome what Gail has said, and I look forward to it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Graham. Chris, sorry. Chris McWhiney. Quite all right, convener. Um, thanks very much for the report. It's a good report. It's nice, neat and tidy, and it gives you all the details you need. Um, first point's a comment and, and, and then a request. So the comment would be on the table on page 44. Um, now, the, the vast majority of complaints I get about the state of roads in Inverclyde, you know, the, the potholes and the craters, um, are not roads that are under the jurisdiction of Inverclyde Council. It's uh, the trunk road network. So would it be possible to put the trunk road information on this table so that we can see the level of investment in the trunk roads um, and the, the percentages? Because I think you would see quite a stark difference there. And it would also highlight, which I think is you know a big problem, is you know we want to try and share services with council to council and our council, but you know we have services within our boundaries that perhaps if we shared, we would get a better outcome. You know, I've said for a while, if we were responsible for fixing the trunk roads in Inverclyde and the Scottish Government gave us extra funding to do that, I think we would have a much better service because, you know, you wouldn't have a team of, of people, you know, up in Branchton fixing a pothole in Branchton and then driving by potholes on the A78 back to the depot. Or, 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 you know, you can pick, you can pick street lights somewhere. You can pick examples across Inverclyde. I think for as long as we allow our trunk roads to be managed by um, an external agency out with our control, we will get 100% of the blame for the condition of the roads and we'll get absolutely 0% in terms of service. And I think that's exactly the, the, the reason, as Councillor Brooks says, that lots of people are unhappy because when they drive into Inverclyde, you know, the potholes they hit on the A8, uh, they get the building roundabout, you know, you're, you're, you're lucky if you, you don't puncture a tyre. People think, you know, that's Inverclyde. People don't care what badge is on a van. They just think of a roads in Inverclyde, it's our responsibility. And I think perhaps we should be making representations to the Scottish Government that, you know, if they can't get the roads fixed, we will do it for them if they give us the funding to do so. Uh, but the request I've got is on the, the bullet points at the bottom of page 47. So in terms of the data provided, one of the, the issues you identify is traffic management. I've got a real concern in terms of traffic management, or should that be traffic flow on the, the what I can only describe in the most um, humble of terms as a Montrosity lane that currently flows from Patrick Street in Greenock along to what was the start of the Esplanade. Um, you know, who installed that bicycle lane without first, you know, testing it in some sort of model 
I don't know, but it clearly does not work. You know, I've been down five occasions to inspect the traffic, and it's quite clear that you know it just doesn't work. And why am I raising this? Because you know I've got a lot of constituents in the east side of Gourock, that that's their main artery into Inverclyde and onto Glasgow. They're now, because of this traffic issue, going up Larkfield Road, that's putting more traffic in an area that's already got speed cameras because of the difficulties we've got. It then puts more traffic up over onto Glenover Road. It puts more traffic all the way up onto by Notre Dame, by schools, and then down onto Bakersbury because of this one issue, which you know I just think it doesn't matter how many reports I see, this simply will not work. So my requests to officers would be, would we be able to get an all members briefing on this matter so that we can raise these points? And would we be able to have a report to the next committee so that members can instruct officers to remove the bicycle lane at that section of the road? Some members, Councillor Curley, you know, who's a bicycle enthusiast, may disagree and want to keep the bicycle lane in place. I certainly wouldn't, but I think we should have the opportunity at committee through a report to actually put that point across and have that section removed. Chris, I've given you a wee bit of latitude to there because we want to actually here to, to discuss the, the, the bicycle lane. Uh, I've, I've actually had a conversation with Stuart as well about this. Stuart, do you want to come in and maybe give Chris an update of you know, where we are with this? Yeah, through you, Convener. Um, Councillor McElhenney, I've met with uh, my roads officers in respect of the, the cycle lane that's been installed on the A770. Um, there are a number of issues which have been highlighted to us. You'll be aware that the works are not complete. However, there are changes that which are being made. I've met again with officers this morning and I've asked them to look at a number of items which they are happily doing. And we will provide members with a briefing note in the early part of next week. The purpose of that briefing note will be to explain what we're doing what we've done and what we're proposing to change, if anything, in order that we can ensure that our active travel policy is maintained whilst also recognising the challenges that are faced by other users of pavements and shared surfaces as well as roads. And I will happily share that in the early part of the week with all members of this council. Um, the, there will be changes which are being made to the uh, right turns at Patrick Street, because we recognise that that is an, a, a, an area of concern. We're also looking at the flow within the area and how best we implement the decision that was made by the Environment and Regeneration Committee to install this temporary cycle lane in the first place and recognising that members of the public have identified that there are challenges, but we do want to ensure that cycling and shared surfaces and walking remain a priority with them in the club. Okay. Gail, do you want to address uh, Chris's other point, please? About the trunk road? Yes, no, happy to do that. Thank you, convener. Thank you, councillor. Yes, we meet with Transport Scotland on a monthly basis, so we have a liaison meeting. Um, we bring forward any concerns that we are made aware of. We do bring up any condition of carriageway, ponding, uh, traffic movement, anything like that that um, has been made aware to us. We also don't wait for those liaison meetings. So if something comes to us, we direct it straight to Transport Scotland and ask them to address it. Um, in relation to being able to pull together their um, performance and how that is uh, can be pull together along with our own performance, we'll need to ask them how they receive that information. It's not contained within the same information that we receive of all local authorities because they are not um, so assessed in the same way. So we will ask the question, we'll ask them how they bring together that criterion and their own information and performance, and then I will update committee on that. You okay with that, Chris? Yes, that, that's much obliged. And I suppose committee should, I think, express that we'd be disappointed if Transport Scotland wouldn't provide that information because it seems pretty basic information that we're asking for. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jim, Jim Cockerton. Yeah, just just firstly, I, I was actually going to comment on the, the trunk rows that Chris has so eloquently done. So just supporting these comments there. People don't really care what road they're on, they, they just see it as a road and they just see it as the council's responsibility for repairing it. So I totally agree with those comments. 
Um, just to add on with regard to the cycling, of course, as local members, we've raised it as well. Um, we're, we're very much supportive of the act of travel, and I think everybody has been, but we've just got to make sure it's not to the detriment of either um, pavement users or as much as possible other road users as well, i.e. the cars. And I'm quite happy that we're going to look at it and make, I was going to say minor alterations, but alterations where, where required on it. So we know where the pinch points are. Chris mentioned a couple of them um, going into the traffic lights. So happy with that and happy that we, we give that a look um, and hopefully resolve some of the issues. Okay, thanks, Jim. Chris, probably. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. A couple of points. Uh, um... I'll maybe address some of the issues about cycling a wee bit later on, but I don't want to think about the agenda. When it comes to what the court get, I think it's a good, uh, a, a good thing. It's something that's been brought up and we've discussed this with uh, uh, Scott Allen in the past with respect to how we actually look at our road quality against the Transport Scotland's road quality markers. I'm just wondering, just if you bring the data in, uh, is it good, when we get the data, if we, if we do get these data looking up how our roads are managed and compared to their, their roads. Is the data, is it apples and apples and pears and pears, or are their quality indicators slightly different from ours? My recollection is that they are, and we don't really, we can't really get a, 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 a transfer across, but if officer can confirm that, it would be important that we are, we, we get, we, we can address, if you're putting the information together, that we actually information is, 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 is the same. Uh, with respect to the cycling, yeah, even though I'm a proponent of cycling, I, 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 I drive a car as well, and, and I've, I've been down to that area a number of times just to see how this, this fits in. It does. It does no no act of travel if it's going to cause immediate disruption to to, to the road network. So I'm very pleased to to, to hear that the the concerns a, a number of members have, have have raised over this issue uh, is is being considered by officers. And I look forward to 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 seeing the report uh, next week, which I think would be very welcome. And hopefully we can get a a, a speedy what they call it, a speedy speedy works done here to what they call it, to to tweak any arrangements. There might be minor amendments, there might be major amendments, we never know, but hopefully we can get something there that can actually get an appropriate sharing of the road space uh, between uh, vehicles, cyclists, and of course, for the co pedestrians and people who are wheeling. Because it's important we, uh, we give opportunities for everybody to travel as they wish in Inverclyde. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, any other? Ennis, you want to come in, sorry? Yeah, I was just, you know, hearing all this was talked about with the cycle lane. I'm absolutely in agreement with this cycle lane. It's not working. It's not serving the people of Emma Clyde well. Um, it's, I haven't seen one cycle on it. The cars are trailing but right back at peak times, right back to the co-op and further uh, right down the road. It's, it's just causing major congestion and, and it needs to be sorted sooner than later. I would also like to see figures on, you know, if there's a report coming forward as to how often it's been used by bicycles, because it certainly doesn't seem to be used. And this is peak time in the summer when, if it's going to be used, you would expect that. Okay. Before we go to the recommendations, uh, I think uh, Peter is wanting to just kind of clarify uh, what we agreed to in item number three. Peter, did you want to kind of come back in on that? Yes, but apologies to the committee. I'm so uh, pleased myself for getting your your amendment for 3.3 correct. I've, I've not highlighted 3.4 and 3.5. Um, can I take it that the committee are in agreement with those recommendations as well? Yeah, I think we're in agreement with that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thanks. Stephen, do you want to come in on item number four? Yeah, I was just wanting to come in. I mean, obviously, the, the, the cycle lane is a, is a sort of not part of the report in, in, in specifically, but there's obviously a lot of concerns uh, around the, the cycle lanes, and I certainly share concerns around aspects of it as well. But, I mean, before we all distance ourselves from the cycle lane, I think we should all, all accept that we all had the opportunity to attend all member briefings and feed into the sort of discussions around the, the, the cycle lane. And we all agreed in principle to, to invest money in the cycle lanes and we, we've agreed as part of budgets to put extra money into active travel, et cetera, as well. So in, in principle, um, we are very supportive of trying to encourage active travel and, and, and encourage uh, more people to, to cycle. We've had 
lots of representations over recent years from the local cycling fraternity around these type of issues. Um, so while there, there clearly are particular issues that need to be addressed, I, I think what's been done has been done with the best of intentions, um, but clearly there are areas where it's no working as we possibly envisaged when we looked at it on the map in terms of the all members briefing. But, but let's not all be jumping on the bandwagon, to be perfectly honest, and, and, and having a real goal when we all collectively, uh, and I include myself in that, had the opportunity to engage in the process when it was being developed and designed. Okay. Thanks for that, Stephen. Okay. Can we agree the recommendations on number four? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, number five is the residual waste contract award. Uh, Chris, did you want to come in on this at the start? Yes. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I see the not for publication virtues, and having read them, I simply don't agree with them. You know, I've referenced back the item that we just had in terms of the consultation. You know, we published the names of some forty citizens of Inverclyde that took part in a consultation, you know, albeit, you know, a nice friendly consultation, but nonetheless, their names were published in this agenda. Um, I, I don't I don't see why we would have to have a, you know, a Scotland XL tender exercise agreement in private session for a contract worth £13 million, pounds, you know, when simply, of course, you could have just put the names of the organisations in a private, a, a private appendix, if that was your main concern. So I would move that this Pending, of course, I'm sure that we're legal. Also, I want to, you know, explain that. Uh, I, I would move that this item is taken in public session. Okay. Now we've been uh, we've been asked to, to to have the paper in the, in private. Peter, could you give me the the legal kind of stance on this, please? Uh, sure. So the the nature of the report is is such that it contains information that constitutes exempt information. Um, so th that means that uh, the committee ca it can then decide to have that heard in private. Now, the, the concern is that, that you would disclose such information. And in this case, it's information relating to financial or business affairs of, of the, obviously the tenderers, the amount of any expenditure proposed to be incurred, um, the terms that are proposed to be imposed, uh, and the identity of the tendering parties. Um, the the distinction between this and the earlier example that Councillor McElhenney has quoted of the consultation, uh, the consultation was made clear uh, in all the notices circulated that um, any responses would form part of a public re a public report uh, to this committee. So anyone responding to that consultation would be well aware that their information was going to be brought into the public domain. Um, the the concern with discussing a paper of this sort in the or or, or rather of the sort in relation to the tender. Uh, in public would be the risk that confidential information of this sort gets brought into the public domain, which could uh, seriously expose the council to a risk of challenge uh, and the, obviously a risk then of, of litigation and with the costs uh, and potential reputational damage that goes with that. Okay. Stephen, do you want to come in just now? Yeah, I suppose in, in answer to, to Steph, the reporter's question, we're not yet in the private session, so you don't need to leave. You'll be put out if we do get into a private session. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 we clearly have the report in front of us, and that report is an exempt report in terms of the legal advice, and is in the private part of the meeting. Therefore, I mean, I'm happy to accept that we cannot have that report put into the public domain in its current format. Um, we could, as as is the case tomorrow, the 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 um, policy and resources committee potentially have a two part report. But we've got the report, and it's a single report. I suppose the the question for Peter is, uh, are we able to to discuss the principles of the report in public as long as we don't disclose the commercially sensitive information that he has referred to? Uh, well, the answer to that, the answer to that is yes. That obviously, the advice to to take it into the private session is that as as the discussion around the item progresses, um, there's always a danger that inadvertently such information could be disclosed. 
Um, but it is it is the decision of the committee as to, as to whether it does or does not wish it to be to be heard in public. Um, if it was to be heard in public, um, obviously the legal advice is we should take this in private. But if it is to be heard in public, then you would um, extreme caution would need to be exercised uh, not to, to to discuss matters such as um, the uh, unsuccessful tenders, sums involved, the parties of un who have been unsuccessful in the tendering process, etc. The successful tenderers will become will come into the public domain in the fullness of time when the award is made uh, through the Scotland Excel system uh, and in further reporting to the Policy and Resources Committee. Chris, do you want to come back up? Yeah, thanks. That's that's all reasonable. I guess there's just a balance here. You know, I, I believe that citizens should be able to see that members of their council are, you know, going to discuss the awarding of a contract, which is, you know, I guess I can't say the exact value. But, but say in the region of thirteen million pounds, you know we shouldn't have to rely on citizens trawling Scotland Excel to find out, you know, this is the level of money that their council's spending and this is the amount of money their council's committing contracts. I don't see how, you know, the majority of this report section, certainly section five and future waste contracts, certainly quite a lot of the background, certainly quite a lot of the summary. You know, it's just basic information that I think could be made available to the public. And of course, the nitty gritties of contracts, we could just move into private session. You know, so in future, I'd like it if the committee could maybe take that on board and we could, you know, have reports to suit so that we can be as transparent as possible whilst, you know, protecting the commercial sensitivities and the legal obligations as a council. Mm -hmm. David? Yeah, I mean, just, just to clarify on Chris's point about the, the, the tender value, as Peter said, that actually will appear in the report to the policy and resources because we had six monthly reports on tenders. Um, to, to committee and the, the details of the successful tenderers and the, the value of the contract awards appear in that report, and that is a public report. Yeah. So, Stuart, can I, can I maybe bring bring you in here, maybe, maybe yourself or Peter can, can, can answer this? So, taking Chris's point uh, uh, on board, is it possible in future that, that these kind of items can be kind of Split into a kind of public and private, uh, you know, maybe with a, with a private appendix or, or whatever. Is that something that we can we can maybe look at? Can we have through you? Simply yes. The the irony in, in this is that the reason that the reports were late, and for my apology at the beginning, was the debate that was taking place as to what could be considered in private and what could be considered in public. But very much happy to take on the committee's comments and. As much information as we possibly can will be made in the public section of the report with uh, where appropriate private appendices. Okay. Now, I, I think for, I think if we're going on to item five, it would be my intention to to kind of heed the advice of the the kind of legal uh, department and and have this particular item held in private uh, with a proviso that going forward. Uh, we can maybe do what we just discussed there, and maybe have more information uh, in the public domain, or as much information in the public domain as is possible. Can we agree on that today? Is that okay with you, Chris? I would agree. Yes, yeah. with, with that with that concession that you've accepted, I'm, I'm happy to agree right. to that. Right. You know. Okay. So, Steph, on that note, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to leave the meeting. Okay, I think Steph has now left. If I can maybe just have that. Can I agree on that? Yeah. Okay, okay. So item number five is the residual waste tender outcome report. Uh, it's Kenny Lang's report. Uh, Gail, are you taking that share? Yes, thank you, convener. Um, members may recall that at the last committee, um, officers asked for approval to go to tender for a mini tender for residual waste collection. It's looking for a period of three years, but with the opportunity to extend to when the landfill tax ban is due to come in, which is December 2025. And that's to provide comfort to the local authority in case we are not fully up and running by that date um, until that date. So um, two tenders have been received and the information is contained within the report. 
um, officers recommend their um, acceptance of bar environmental, and you'll see the um, both of the values, the bid responses within 4.4 of the report. Um, so, as advised, the contract is due to run until 16th of August 2024, but with that opportunity to extend to the end of December 2025. Um, in item 5, um, it sets out the next steps being carried out by the service in relation to looking forward to the long term waste solution. And a further update on this is expected to be presented to committee in autumn of this year, just to give a further update of progress in that. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Gail. Stephen, I think you're first up. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, convener. It would be helpful to, to get Gail's thoughts in terms of the, the responses to the tenders that we got in terms of what are the that are current market conditions in terms of uh, people that are, are interested in providing these services. And there's obviously a, a reasonably significant difference in, 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 in price uh, between the the, the, the the tenderers and how, how sort of that reflects in terms of the market. Secondly, in terms of the the the, the longer term position what are what are our hopes in terms of the the longer term position? Are we able to 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 be confident that we potentially could get some sort of a longer term deal with potentially partner councils? And the third question is in relation to the the financial implications. Obviously, we know the 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 value of the contract over the next few years, but how how does that Compare to what we're currently paying in in in, in uh, waste services. Are we going to save money, or more likely, is it going to cost us a bit of extra money or whatever? What's the what's the budgetary implications of, of, of accepting this contract? Thank you, Councillor, and through you, Convener. Um, we had two bids, so that is pretty low. Um, we would have anticipated that there would be additional. Um, contractors that would be interested. So I think as part of the market testing that we're doing for the long term strategy, we'll be looking into that to find out why that is the case and the number of interested parties out there. We have already started soft market testing and that the way that we are meeting with potential contractors for that long term waste solution. We've been having those discussions, looking at what they would be proposing and what stage they are at because a number of um, businesses have, say, a planning application, they've got land, but they maybe don't have the actual facility ready yet, but will do by the time um, of the landfill tax ban. So there's a lot of piece, bits of work going on in the background, looking at what's available in the marketplace currently and what will be available in the marketplace. Um, so, and we are looking at that either as a one, a two, a three, or a five local authority. And what we need to do as Inverclyde is look at what's the best value for us, whether we're better doing it alone or doing it with one, two, three, uh, four partners. And that will be part of that report that comes to members to consider. And um, the financial implications are that it's the same. Um, cost that we have been quoted in this tender exercise as we have previously been paid. What we are seeing is tonnages are fluctuating. So the tonnages are higher currently because of people being at home. And so that's it's not just in so the tonnage, uh, the price per tonnage is the same as we're currently paying. We hope that um, the fluctuation will settle as people go back to normal living, go back to working in offices, back out for dinner, things like that. And that has an effect on that kind of waste at the house. And um, But there is quite a difference between the two tenders, which you rightly pointed out. And that's something that we will look into and review and whether that is um, atypical of the marketplace. And the what is noted, though, is the fact that Although the cost, the price is the same that we've been quoted in this tender, actually 
they have included the fact that the landfill tax ban has actually risen and they've not passed on that rise to us. So in actual terms, the price is actually slightly lower if you took off that landfill tax increase off that cost. I hope I've picked up everything. Yeah, no, that's helpful, Gil. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Gil. Chris, Chris McElhenney. Yeah, thank Thanks, convener. It's just along the same line as Councillor McCabe had, had highlighted. So, just try to just see where the numbers are exactly. When you say the price is the same, so the 108.04 per tonne, the new price, yeah. So, I was just, I mean, 12.94 million is just a big number. So, I was just wondering in terms of, you know, I guess we've not really much choice to commit because you want to pick up waste, you need to pay for it. But how does that factor into the, the numbers that we had in the budget? Going forward, what, what did what did we agree in terms of? So it's from seventeenth of August this year to August twenty twenty four. So is that under what we had agreed as a council? Is it over? Maybe some just one extra sentence or two in the report and information just to you know give members peace of mind that actually you know you're just a, you're approving a contract that you do actually have funded in your budget or actually you don't have this funded, so you're going to need to, you know that you obviously you'd have asked us to refer to policy and resources if there was a uh, an issue, so I guess that means that this is perhaps substantially below what we had budgeted for for this period. Um, through you, convener. Uh, thank you, councillor. This is in line with what we have budgeted because it is in line with what we've previously been paid because they have um, submitted the same cost per tonnage that we have been paying in our previous contract. Um, the I. I take that as a point that we would take, we can bring forward in further reports, a comment and related to that, what that means. The cost pressure would be in relation to the tonnages increasing rather than the price per tonnage. So yeah. there is a COVID implication currently in the fact that um, nationally we are getting increased tonnages because of the way people are living. Um, but the actual financial Budget pressure is not because of the cost per tonnage because that remains the same. Yeah, so just just a follow up on that convener. So th does that yeah. mean effectively we kind of just got lucky then? Because say this tender came back and you know the the the, the cost tonnage was you know one hundred and thirty two pound across the board. We had budgeted for one hundred and eight pounds, so we hadn't actually budgeted for you know the price might go up. And I think you said yourself you were you know a bit surprised that it's not went up because obviously they've you know they've they've they've, they've borne the the burden of the, the landfill tax. So just in terms of getting into that level of detail, we were setting a budget each year. So, you know, we could effectively, you know, been in a position here that actually, you know, we were hundreds of thousands of pounds short of the position budget because we budgeted, you know, that it would just be flat going forward, which, you know, I wouldn't imagine long term that's going to be very likely. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you, councillor. We budget for an inflation rise. Um, and we look at the market as well. There is a substantial increase when we look at the next tender. Um, so that is something that we will be looking at in the way of market testing. Why is there that big difference? And is the 108 or the 132 more typical of the market? Because we'll need to be aware of that as we um, plan for the future. Yeah, sorry, just to uh, convener, because I'm quite interested in this point. So, have we budgeted for an inflation rise, but there's not been an inflation rise, right? So, we've budgeted for the existing contract plus inflation. That must be a bigger number than what we've got. So, does that not mean there's going to be a potential underspend of like £280,000 or something like that? Okay, would you want me to bring in Matt, uh, Matt Thompson on this? I think Matt would like to come in. Matt? Thank you, Yavina. Yeah, it's just, what Gil's saying is essentially correct. We set the budget each year based on the existing contract. Um, we were aware of our contract inflation. We built that into the budget process. And obviously, at this stage, we weren't aware of building up inflation. So it's not been built in. Uh, the budget is as it is next last year. So essentially, the spend is, uh, well, the spend per, per cost per ton is exactly the same as before. The budget is fine. What we do have every year is that Mr. Perkin holds on to our inflation contingency. If we agree any price increase during the year, we would release money from that contingency to, to allow for that. So what would normally have happened here is that we would return the 
very small saving that Gail has made here, the four pence a ton, for the contingency, but I think that works out at about a thousand pounds or so. So that's around the edges haven't done that. As Gail says, there's been a small saving here in effect because the um, landfill tax increase has been borne by the contractor. So normally Gail would be coming back to myself or Alan at that point and saying, can we have X amount of the contingency to pay for that? And that's not happened this year. So effectively we've taken a bit of pressure off the inflation contingency here. Um, but there's no excess budget within the, the programme. As Gail says the, the pressure is likely to come in tonnage. We'll start more on that during the year, the first one, and we'll come back to the committee um, after some recess and we'll have an idea then what the tonnage is looking at. But obviously it's been difficult over the last year or two for Gail to keep an eye on tonnage. It's just been a changing situation. So hopefully that's helpful, can you know? Yeah, that okay, Mike. I find that all very helpful actually, because I also think it identifies that as members and as a council, surely we have a job to do to, you know, reverse the increase in tonnage. You know, because you know everyone was well. For example, we had no blue bin service um, for about three months. So you know, surely we've got a, a job as a council to proactively encourage people to start using the the recycling bins again. And you know, we may well see at the end of the financial year there is an underspend because you know as the world moves on from COVID and people start you know recycling and going to work again, surely the, the household waste hopefully would would, would decrease. Mm -hmm. Can we get your comment on that? Thank you, convener. Thank you, councillor. Yes, that is something that we have raised as a team that we'd wish to do a bit of communications to try and encourage residents and businesses. And uh, I suppose, um, as all anyone in the local authority area, to try and get back to that good practice, try and get back to um, just sort of reviewing what waste they put in which bin. And also the fact that people will, we, we anticipate that as people go back to normal living, that sort of level of residual waste will reduce. Right, okay, okay. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Chris Conway. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, I think that was one of the points I was going to make there at the end, so that, that, that's very good uh, about making sure that we actually really go get out and get the message out there to get people recycling again. One of the things I'm wondering, though, looking at this, is are we are we getting an, an impact on the garden waste uh, and the charge for that? Uh, have you noticed an increase? How much of that increase is due to COVID, and how much is due to the fact that we now have uh, people paying an extra thirty one pound or so for the garden waste? Is that is that contributed to a little bit of our increase in the the bulk landfill waste? And secondly, uh, on this issue, are we also getting a reduction in our uh, Commercial uh, waste recovery. If people are not going to work, etc., and they're working from home, there's always a tendency for them to put uh, waste that would normally be in the in in the, in the office and the commercial waste into the the, the residential waste, as you, as you noted. Uh, so, have you also noted a reduction in any income from uh, the commercial waste recovery? Gail, yeah, two points. Yep. Th yep thank you, councillor. Thank you, convener. Um, in relation to the bulk landfill and the green waste, we're not seeing that that's necessarily the case. It appears to be that it's just the amount of waste because people are at home. You know, they're eating at home, they're um, doing all their activities at home, and that's where the increase in waste is. Um, nationally, the waste network are actually looking at what increase in waste and what has what is within that increase of waste and they'll share that information we'll feed it we'll feed into that as well and at the appropriate time we can share that with members um, and it'll also help us direct how we reduce that waste because we'll be able to see what the increase actually is in relation to commercial waste um yes there was, there was a drop as businesses were closed for a period however most businesses are now up and running again within our commercial waste, and we'll be reviewing that with our colleagues in finance, what the implications of that are. Okay, thanks very much. That's what councils are good at, talking rubbish. So thanks very much. <laughs> Can we agree the recommendations uh, for the item five? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you.